Welcome to the original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, one of my favorite ex mob busters and mafia historians, analysts, content makers, Gary Jenkins, coming back on the show. Uh, he's always been one of my favorite guests from Kansas City, K KCPD, uh, OC was uh was one of the main guys back in the heyday uh chasing these <laughs> Sevilla crime family guys around it's a crime family that has a lineage um a lot of the same names from the 60s and 70s are around today at just a much lesser lower profile um less power and so forth but uh Gary thank you for joining us and we're going to talk some Kansas City mob all right, Scott. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. I always like coming on your show, even when it gets me in trouble here in Kansas City. I still like coming on your show. <laughs> well, we lo we love uh, uh, shedding the light on, on Kansas City. It's such a hidden gem when it comes to uh, organized crime research, and uh, it, in terms of underrated impact, uh, it's very easy to forget because it's never yeah. been a huge, never been a huge family, and it's in a kind of quieter place than most. Uh, mob regimes that are more well known: New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, Detroit, whatever. And um, but they wielded a lot of power, and uh, were pretty brutal and uh, pretty uh, yeah. savvy, and and uh, were were in some ways mythologized in the movie Casino, which I think a lot of people that's their kind of point of reference for Kansas City. When yeah, I think so. So uh, this week. Well, I should say last week, uh, you had a uh, Kansas City mob figure named uh, Mark Marky Sorrentino get out of prison after about 12, 13 years. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk to Gary a little about him and his one time superior uh, mentor, uh, Vincey Black Bishota, who we went away with back in. 2009 10-ish for uh, arson and we're going to talk about the guy that helped marky sorrentino get out somebody that we had an interview with on the same podcast this week uh eddie cox who is a, a not kind of a hidden gem again uh, a legend from for people that know he's a legend other people might never heard of him but this guy was in his day in his space was very notorious the the movie the king of new york was partially based on him christopher walken um he helped marky sorrentino get out of prison and he's been helping other guys get out of prison he helped john johnny mandacina another kansas city mafia soldier so gary uh that's enough of me talking uh give us your first give us uh your recollections of, of Eddie Cox, who right now, 89 years old, <laughs> did 30 years in prison, uh, did more than that, but did a 30 year stretch, got out a couple years ago and is now working as a paralegal, uh, helping, helping guys get out of prison. What, what are your, what's your, um, memories of, of his legacy and reputation and whatnot? Well, well, Scott, you know, this guy, he, he was like a, if people in the know, like you said, you gotta be in the know. Uh, for people in the know, he was like a legend in Kansas City the, in the professional criminal element, whether you're black or white or Italian or whatever, Peckerwood, it doesn't matter. If you're a professional criminal and been in and out of the prison system, the federal prison system especially, you're going to know Eddie Cox. You're going to know something about him. You know, he, he hit the headlines back in the early 70s. He was supposedly the brains and the genius behind what we call we we called the black mafia uh, it was a really it was a heroin drug ring that was pretty successful a guy named doc dearburn and eugene richardson and two or three other guys and that it looks like they were connected to uh the savella family it kind of on the periphery in that uh guy named um uh, uh, uh oh god oh, the shotgun god. shotgun joe guy yeah you know, all that through joe Santamano. Santamano had a, a liquor store down in the black neighborhood of 19th and Vine. It was historically the old black neighborhood going back into the turn of the century. And, and he was connected to 
you know, black politicians and, and black professional criminals and, and this Doc Gilbert and Eugene Richardson knew all them. And and so, you know, if if the North End or the Italian mafia wanted something done or wanted some agreement or had some message, they could go to Joe Santamano and he had connections to this black mafia. And and Eddie Cox was right in there with them. They they used to say he was the genius, the brains behind it. I think I said that uh, this whole heroin thing. And and they finally took him down. They they busted everybody. They busted Eddie Cox. They got and he was a hill. Of, just so people understand, he's a hillbilly. I mean, he's a he's white a, guy. Yeah, he's, he's a white guy. He wasn't. He wasn't was was right. <laughs> so it, it, that's why there's the the analogy or the connection to the King of New York, Christopher Walken, um, even though it didn't. The movie didn't take place in Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, the the people that made that movie uh, were inspired by the fact that you had this white guy who yeah. led a mostly black mafia. I I also want to just color up that I I think at least from my research, and I want you to comment on this, and then I'll just you know get back to you and shut up. Uh, it looked like that the 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 brain trust, if you will, of the of the Kansas City Black Mafia. You had Doc Dearborn, who was the the, the scary face of the franchise, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And and Doc and uh, then Doc had Eddie Cox and Eugene Richardson. Who I think they called Seal. They were they were like a a, a thunder and lightning uh, criminal intelligentsia in, in the sense mm -hmm. that they were Gene Richardson from what I can, can get was more of a, a racketeer. And then Doc Dearborn was more of a gangster. And then Eddie Cox was like a racketeer and a gangster and an alleged killer. Yeah. So I just yeah, want, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want people to think that we're saying that there's a white guy that was the brains of all these black. Oh people. yeah. Yeah. I just yeah, want to be yeah, clear that I think true. it was yeah. seal Richardson and yeah. Eddie were the brain trust for doc Dearborn, yeah. who was more kind of the, the Nikki Barnes, if you will, uh, yeah. the guy that was yeah, on the street that everybody uh, knew about. Yeah. That, that That's a much better way to put it. There's no doubt about it. That uh, doc Dearborn, you know, the people on the street knew him as the man, he was the boss. Eddie Cox was in the background as, and Eugene Richardson on the streets was a guy that, you know, was much feared on the streets and, and they knew who these guys were, but Doc Dearborn was definitely the man. And there was a guy, another guy named Jimmy Willis, who was really close to both them and to Cork Savella. We used to see him down at the market all the time talking to Cork Savella and, and he will go on and stay in the drug business and stay close to Cork Savella uh, his whole life, really, and going in and out of the penitentiary. And, and so that's kind of the, the intersection of black and white organized crime was, was through these guys there back going all the way back to the 70s, late 60s and early 70s. There was so, so much money to be made in uh, heroin. And, and then when they go into the penitentiary, well, Eddie Cox... He really, you know, in, in some ways he blossoms in the penitentiary, which some guys do because he's smart and he becomes a jailhouse lawyer. He's a guy that can write writs. He can, he's the one that will do the study required in the law library and come up with the, you know, the, uh, not only the writs or writs of habeas corpus they used to use trying to get another trial, but you know, the appeals and, and when guys couldn't hire up Ford lawyers and you couldn't get legal aid to do anything. Eddie Cox was there probably for, you know, a carton of smokes or whatever. I, you know, however that prison economy works, it's a little different, but he was, he was there and he was a smart guy. He was, he became well known throughout the whole penitentiary system. I mean, he was, he and another uh, mob guy in Kansas city, uh, junior Bradley, those two guys, they, they knew they were the go-to guys for the federal prison system because what we don't realize sometimes a lot of people don't is these guys, they live in these disparate cities in a huge country. Well, they get to know each other in the penitentiary and then they go out of the penitentiary. And so you need something in Kansas city. Oh yeah. I was in with junior Bradley and he's got, I know he's got this store down there is a restaurant, you know, call junior Bradley and then he'll, you know, he'll get it set up for you. And, and Eddie Cox was one of those guys that, and he could run in both circles. So he was, he was kind of doubly valuable to a lot of people. He was, uh, you know, the, he was the go-to guy and that's, uh, that's kind of how it works. So, you know, he's 
they come out and Eugene Richardson and Doc Dearborn, they, I don't know exactly what happened. They, they started dealing dope again immediately. Eddie Cox was not involved with them and didn't appear. And well, he was get a, killed in, in a drug rip off. Right. Well, Richardson got killed too. I think he did. I'm pretty sure he did at that hotel. Well, Doc uh, Dearborn. Did, did, that, he I'm, wrong, got, I'm wrong. Doc Dearborn and that woman got killed at a hotel room where they yeah. were uh, apartment building where they were selling dope out of. Now, 85. By, by the I said, I forgot what, I forgot what happened to him. It seemed like he just kind of disappeared. Yeah. So, well, we talked to Eddie about it and Eddie, um, Eddie went away for a big chunk of the seventies. Yeah. And then Doc Dearborn and uh, Eugene Richardson, while Eddie was away, got uh, some of the, the, um, the drug landscape had shifted and that heroin had turned to cocaine and yeah. uh, crack. And uh, Eddie was battling his, his, uh, his court battles at that time in the eighties when, when Doc and, and Seal were uh, doing that and all that stuff happened in 85. We asked him if, cause there has, there's always been rumors. Um, and I talked to Gary about this, that, that Doc Dearborn's murder in 85 happened at the same time that there was the transition in the Kansas city Italian mafia leadership uh, between the Sevillas and the Camisanos. And there was a series of murders uh, and there had been maybe there had been rumors that maybe Doc Dearborn had fit into that. Uh, Eddie Cox had had nothing to do with it. Just a, a, a drug yeah. rip off that went bad. Yeah. That's, that's, I know a guy that he told me, you know, he said, oh, the nephews of this big John Long who were drug addicts and trying to be drug dealers themselves are the guys that did it. And they wouldn't have been anybody that, you know, the mob would have trusted. So, you know, and I, I don't know if they really, I, I never did pull that case file or anything. I never did go look at it exactly and, and to see what was really known about it. Cause Eddie Cox, you know, the next time I run into him, he's back out and it's really interesting. He is, working for a lawyer who is a mob lawyer, Byron Fox. And he's the paralegal for Byron Fox. All of a sudden we start getting word in the unit. Uh, I'm back in. I, I've gone out as a sergeant and come back in as a sergeant. And, uh, and so we get word that this Eddie Cox is out here. I remember seeing him on the street. I lived in, in the midtown part of the city at the time. And I was just out one night doing something. I don't even remember what. And I see this car that looks like a police car. And I think, well, who's that? And it was like a, a Ford uh, Crown Vic and it had an antenna on it. And I thought, well, who's that? Well, that's, that's not a, that, those license plate aren't ours. Who is that? So I look closer and it's Eddie Cox. <laughs> what else? So I just sit back and I watch and, and there's a prostitute walking down the street and he pulls over and he talks to her for a while. And then he drives on off and I try to follow him a little bit. I'm off duty on my old time. So I didn't work too hard at it, but you know, and he, he kind of drifts away and, and, you know, we start looking at what the heck is this guy doing? And, you know, that's when we find out he is, he's out. He is a paralegal for this mob lawyer and, doing his thing, going to work down there and really doing it. So, you know, you kind of, then that was a, don't pay much attention to the guy. That was in the, I just want to, uh, just to make sure people understand the timeline. That was in the eighties that right, we're talking. Like, so Eddie, yeah. Eddie did some time uh, in the seventies and this is where he gained that reputation uh, in the federal prison system. Right. He says that he met, you, you got to, this guy's almost 90 years old right now. He says he met the Sevillas actually in the fifties. So like, this goes past the, possible. beyond the 60s. Uh, yeah. And according to the federal government, they think that he is uh, somebody that has been involved in possibly dozens of, of gangland assassinations. So he's somebody that had a reputation as being not just very intelligent, but very but lethal. Um, yeah. So he comes out. So there's two separate situations where he comes out and goes to work for a lawyer. There's the situation that we're talking about right now in 2024, which we're going to yeah. get to in a second. Um, and he's been out since 21. So there's the, the three years that he's been doing it now, but Gary's talking about, I don't want people to be confused. Gary's talking about, he comes out of prison in the eighties after uh, gaining this reputation in the federal system in the seventies, goes to work for an attorney in Kansas city in the eighties. This is when Gary's observing him. And He's doing all this on the up and up, but at the same time, he admitted to the, he, he talked to, to us about this on our interview. He's 
no longer dealing drugs. He's just robbing drug dealers. <laughs> robbing drug dealers. <laughs> yeah. So now I, I give it back to you. Yeah. And primarily Hispanic drug dealers. Of course, that by then, see, that's who's got the money. That's who's making the money. By the 80s, the uh, blacks still have a certain, you know, piece of the action as far as the inner city and midtown drug dealers. But the more higher end is going to be Hispanic. And, and so he starts robbing Hispanic drug dealers. I remember we had a uh, the, uh, the, uh, the a case agent working that case. He got hold of me. And, and for some reason, this is kind of, before we had the huge influx of Hispanic people into the United States, he's looking for an interpreter. The FBI didn't have an interpreter. So I, I'd line him up with somebody, a, a lady that works as a secretary in police headquarters that speaks Spanish as well as she speaks English and, you know, grew up with it. And, and so he starts taking these victims from these robberies, drug robberies down and interviewing them using our, our interpreter. <laughs> And, and he makes a case on him off of that. And because, you know, if you've got anybody that'll testify on a case like that, that Eddie Cox did something, they're going with it. They're not going to mess around. They're going with it. They didn't look for any bigger conspiracies. And they just wanted to take down Eddie Cox and, and keep it separate from that lawyer. Cause you got to be real careful messing with him. Cause he's working to this lawyer. And so they, it looked to me like they just had this one agent, as far as I could tell, assigned to work that case and and he worked it up and, and made the case on him we served a search warrant actually on uh on his uh apartment that afternoon when they they were going to take him down <laughs> and my guys were called over by that uh, agent to help him just kind of be you know cannon fodder if you will just help him go through the the uh apartment i drove over by there kind of a little side story i drove over by there i was kind of kind of like distracting for me. I had something else going. I'd been meeting with the FBI on something else. And I had in my trunk, I had a, my briefcase. I just threw it in the trunk because I was going to stop and go inside this building where they were serving the search warrant. They didn't really find anything big there. And I had this list of phone numbers and people from a pin register that they'd had going on a guy named Johnny Joe Clea and George Bruton who had a huge meth operation. These were really bad characters. So they had given me this list to take back and give to our analyst to put in and, you know, have this information. <laughs> so I take the, I, I'm kind of, you know, like get distracted by this search warrant. I go on home and I, for some reason, my wife was in the driveway and I parked on the street and I left the car out and I come out to that night, the next morning, my car's been stolen with that stuff in the trunk. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. It was a, it was a crisis that the FBI hit with us too. We found it. <laughs> it was just a street kid that did it. We found it. So all's well, it is well. So that's a, it's a little aside to Eddie Cox. Yeah. <laughs> it a distraction. <laughs> what, what, what did he, uh, I, I know there's a lot of lore about him in Kansas city and he wasn't a, he wasn't like a white guy that was coming in to try to, co-op black culture or co-opt uh you know uh, take advantage of black people he seemed to be someone that genuinely w was part of the was part of the culture and it, it was almost it was seamless he was a a guy that came from like you know a peckerwood or hillbilly background but yeah. but was ingratiated into the black community he dated black women has black kid or half black kids um did you what what was the did, how did he dress? Like, what was his demeanor when you were following him around back then? Yeah, you know, just like any other white guy, you know, like any other paralegal you would see with, a, you know, maybe a band line shirt and, and pair of slacks and windbreaker if it was cool. Just, you know, just he so was wasn't, so wasn't, not, wasn't yeah. Austin wasn't ostentatious. Not at all. You wouldn't you would never known that he was anybody. But look, like I said, a paralegal or something that happened to have a car to look like a police car. I mean, he, he had that on, and now we know now why he had that. I didn't think that night. I, I remember thinking, what's he doing a car like that? And I heard he was working for Byron Fox. So I thought, well, I guess search papers and everything kind of wants to look like a cop, but he wanted to look like a cop when he was robbing those, <laughs> pretend like he was a DEA agent. It's what right. he wanted to do. They look outside in the driveway and they see this crap red crown Vic with an antenna on it. You know, I mean, it just adds to the, to the uh, one of his accoutrements to give him legitimacy to get cooperation out of people to make them be relieved that they weren't being robbed. This was just the DEA or the FBI or the police 
And then, you know, he gets them under control and he takes their money and their drugs and, and goes on there and going, oh, my God, wait a minute. <laughs> it's what the cops <laughs> first you're first re you're re relieved. You know, I don't have a case. But then your second thought is, oh, my God, <laughs> look how much he took from me. <laughs> we got to do something here. He had a credential. He's talked about on, our, on the interview. Um, he, you know, he had like a, a DA badge and, uh, you know, had things that actually made it look for real that he was. Yeah, he did. He, he pulled it off. I mean, it's, uh, it's that's a really common thing that, that guys have done. You've seen it right. on TV shows, but in real life, you know, they really but, uh, have done that. And they, they could pull it off. By that point, just to give people some uh, a frame of time reference, and I'm gonna I'm gonna thread this needle. I'm gonna bring us all the way from 1989 to 2024 in the next 20 minutes. Watch me do this. Okay, so uh, his arrest is a is like a, a third strike, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah, he he got a lot of time out of he, it. Yeah, so it more than uh, he normally would have. I don't remember the exact you know legal reasons, but. So the 89 case was a case that wouldn't necessarily, I think, send you away forever, but because he had been a repeat offender, yeah, he's looking like he's never going to get out. Um, at the same time, you got people got to remember that when he's robbing drug dealers and at the end, Doc Dearborn is gone. You know, he's murdered in 85. The Sevillas, yeah. uh, Nick is, uh, you know, he's dead, dead. and everybody's he's in dead. jail. Everybody's yeah. in a penitentiary. Right. The he level. didn't have he didn't have a ton to do with the Camisano regime, and that's no. who was in charge at that point. So, uh, but let's let's take Eddie and put him aside for a second, and then I want to bring us to the um, the Sevilla crime family circa 1989-90, and this is mm -hmm. going to bring us into Mark Sorrentino, mm -hmm. who just walked out of prison. He's 58 years old. Um, so Mark was a part of the younger generation of the Sevilla crime family at that point. A lot of guys that had uh, fathers and uncles, cousins that were yeah. part of the Sevilla regime, um, that which was not which at that point was the Camisano regime, and they all. I'm going to turn it over to to, <laughs> to Gary here and just tee it up. They all had a like a social club that was down the street or a couple blocks away from the trap, which was the, the big Kansas city mafia headquarters in the North end. And uh, there was like 22 dozen of them ish. And they, they start getting her, uh, uh, the, 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 the feds are trying to jam the, the young kids to try to get the older guys. And it becomes a whole big thing in Kansas City and between 89 and 92 uh, became known as the Basta Boys uh, movement. Gary, tell us the story. Well, uh, <laughs> we started, uh, there's a real aggressive, he's still, actually still working for the U.S. attorneys. He should be about ready to retire, named Paul Becker. Real aggressive guy. You do not want Paul Becker on your case. If you ask anybody in Kansas City, they hate Paul Becker in Kansas City. A lot because of this, but He's a bulldog, man. He is a bulldog. We've had a couple, three of those. Uh, David Helfrey that prosecuted the uh, uh, straw man uh, skimming trials. He was a bulldog. And Mike DeFeo before that, they were just really smart and bulldogs. Well, Paul Becker's the bulldog. And he had this idea that we're running a gambling investigation. And he had this idea. These had probably had the FBI probably had some sources that these young guys have started their own social club, just a couple of blocks from the, the old guys social club. And, and, you know, and it was interesting, I think is his, historically the old guys social club was once the young guys social club about two blocks from another club that was the old guys social club. So it's just this uh, progression of uh, the younger generation coming into their own. So these guys are all going down there and hanging out and, and playing cards in there and, and, we, I, I can't remember how it came about, but Paul Becker must have come to us or an agent did. And I assigned a couple of three officers. I was a sergeant down there. And then I assigned them to, you know, going to go take a look at this club. Can we, can we do a surveillance down in what we call the North end or little Italy It's really hard to do. We'd never done it. 
the bureau had tried to buy a house down there at one time and they, and they, I think they took a burn and they, they never got it burnt. They never got it bought. And it's, you know, one of those neighborhoods, but the neighborhood's changing by the nineties. There's a lot of Vietnamese that moved in, which, you know, that's kind of the progression is because the Catholic church there, uh, historically brought in, you know, helped with the tie-ins and, and help them learn language and get skills and get jobs and call, had something called the Don Bosco center. Well, now, after, in the 70s, the Vietnamese, after the war, Vietnamese started coming in and they did the same thing. They started moving in and uh, we got several Vietnamese restaurants and, and less Italian restaurants down there. Vietnamese owning some of the buildings down there. So we found a Vietnamese guy who had uh, like one of these uh, old three-story apartment buildings, kind of crappy building, a real cheap rent. And he, we had a, a building, they had an apartment on the third floor from which we could see this young guy's social club. So we sent uh, one of our female officers down there to kind of, you know, chat him up a little bit and, and get him kind of comfortable. And, you know, with a woman moving in then having some guys coming and going might not stir much, so much attention. And so she gets, she rents it. I don't know how six months or something has signed a lease for six months and she rents it and pays him some money up front. And, you know, we start going down there in the afternoons and evenings and, you can see the license numbers and write them down. Couldn't really take pictures very good, especially in the evening. There were some trees in the way, but you could see, and then you'd have like a chase car out in front. If there was something you wanted to see, you could call, call out to the chase car and they'd go out and run by. If two guys had walked out and were walking down the street, you couldn't see exactly who it was. Then you, you could go out, have somebody run by and see who it was. And so we did that for several weeks and jotted down all the names and, you know, who was who and who was talking to who and, we saw Pete Simone, who was kind of the, you know, the gambling czar, if you will, in Kansas City, the sports book guy. And, you know, he was coming down there and see him talking to different people. And so, you know, eventually we're going to take this down. You don't keep this going forever. You're going to take this down. And then uh, Paul Becker, he starts calling his guys into the grand jury and asking them specific questions. <laughs> and then they start refusing to testify. And, you know, the old, the old game, everybody's familiar with this, takes them in front of a judge, gives them immunity and said, okay, now you can't claim the fifth amendment. We're going to ask you these questions again. And then when they refuse to testify, then they uh, cite them with contempt and they put them and put them in the penitentiary in the federal and actually up at Leavenworth or up in Rochester, you know, Minnesota or somewhere. They spread, you know, they, spread they, they spread them out. Spread them out. Yeah. Uh, Mark San Arantino, he <laughs> kind of a little story about that. But we'll get to that. And, and so they start putting them in. They got uh, uh, Pete's son, Joe Pete. They got uh, Tony, uh, Tony Mike Nigro, who is Willie Camasano's grandson. They got Cork Savella's nephew, Vince Savella, and, and some other guys that, that you know, maybe weren't, I, I can't remember exactly, weren't blood relation to anybody that was important. And they got this Mark Sorrentino, who we really, really didn't know at the time. He was just a periphery guy. Uh, hanger on, if you will. We didn't really exactly know him. Now I'd say by this time, he must have, he was probably running with uh, Vince Pachota. They probably had, had partnered up by then. And, uh, and what I was going to say about Mark Sorrentino, <laughs> going to these different federal institutions, wherever he went, the word came back to one of my guys through one of his FBI contacts that Mark was in some facility, some federal facility where Joy, Joy Dove's IUPA was. And he was so, he was bragging to everybody how he was in, uh, in with the head of the Chicago outfit and he'd run errands for him and, and do whatever IUPA needed to, to have done. Cause IUPA was this old guy that, that needed help, of course, too. <laughs> I guess Chicago didn't have to be up to anybody up wherever he was. I'm not even sure which one it was, but these guys are, are, you know, they are guys who, they haven't robbed anybody and they haven't used a gun on anybody. They just know, they think, you know, they even, they just think they know the government thinks they know something and they're not talking and their families, you know, jump into it. There's a lawyer, local lawyer named Sam Marable, who's, uh, whose brother has a really uh, nice JJ Marable has a really nice restaurant and down at the 103rd state line called uh, Marable's. And it's been uh, the kind of the premier Italian food, kind of the high end Italian food. And this guy is real well known. The Marable family are real well known. Their father before them as, as a restaurant tour. And so Sam's a lawyer and he turns this into a cause and he starts making 
uh, you know, calling press conferences and they have t-shirts printed up that say Boston, which means enough and becomes known as the Boston movement and the newspapers, the Kansas city star picks up on it. The TV stations, of course, pick up on these uh, press conferences and they go out in front of the federal courthouse and Sam will rail on and on about what an overreach this is by the government, how these kids are innocent and they haven't done anything. And, and the government's just trying to make them talk. They were sold T-shirts. I used to have one of those T-shirts. I can't seem to find it anymore. I wish I'd hung on to it. But uh, so it, it got a lot of press attention. And eventually these guys are released. Uh, the government finally gave up. It was it was really caused them a lot of a lot of heat politically, I believe. Just to give and, people and, context, know, the New York Times did a whole front page story on this uh, in the fall of ninety one. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> what you're saying that the kind of there there was a a, a pressure campaign uh, by yeah. the the there was like a thousand people that signed a petition. I think it was twelve hundred people signed a petition. Uh, this the Basta boys uh, being, you know, uh, persecuted, I guess would be a, a way, uh, persecuted for the sins of their fathers or their uncles. Yeah. And uh, they flew a, uh, a banner over a Kansas City Chiefs game at Arrowhead uh, oh, yeah, in, they did, in, they? in September of 91. <laughs> uh, so by 92, it got resolved. But by the end of 91, the New York Times and the Kansas City Chiefs were finding their way into this, <laughs> uh, into the situation. Yeah, really. See, you can see why Becker had a lot of pray, a lot of heat on the U S attorney who's a politically appointed uh, Becker's yeah. boss would have been the, I think it was Gene Paul Bradshaw. And, and I remember him. He was not the, uh, uh, the biggest crime fighter ever. And he had a lot of political pressure on him uh, over that thing. So I was, I was, I was reading up on this when we were going to do this show and, and I'd forgotten this, but Mark Sorrentino, he's a big, fat guy. He, I think they called him fat Marky yeah. big fat guy. And, and he's tougher in hell too. They tell me, but he's a big fat guy. And he was quoted by, uh, by one of the newspaper reporters when they greeted him, when they came back, did some kind of a press conference or something. He said, you know, he said, I'm glad for that prison time. He said, I got in shape and I lost 75 pounds. So, <laughs> so um, let's, let's, uh, Take us in now. Um, like I said, we're going to thread this needle. Uh, let's take us from 1991 and let's move to 2008. Yeah. And we have uh, Mark Sorrentino at that point is in his 40s and he's a, a bodyguard and driver for. I don't know if a, I don't. I'm not sure if he was officially a capo or not, but definitely somebody that was at that level, Kansas city's always had a more, um, a, a less formal structure. Right. Yeah. Um, and Vinci black Pichota was Mark Sorrentino's boss, I guess for lack of a better term, Vinci goes back to, uh, the original Chucky Morgan, uh, uh Charles Cachacopo. Um, and he was a, 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 a bodyguard for everybody starts as a bodyguard or driver for somebody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's who uh, uh, Vincey went back to, but Vincey and I'm going to, again, I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to tell the, the, the tee up and then I'm going to give it over to uh, Gary. So in 2008, there's a, a, a very famous restaurant in Kansas city called the Hereford house. It was a, a steakhouse that was one of the best uh, in the Midwest at one point, but by the 2000s had fallen in disrepair. And the owner goes to Mark Sorrentino and Vinci Pichota and says, let's run an insurance scam and burn this place down. <laughs> Go tell us what you know about that. <laughs> well, and, and during these intervening years, I, and I remember seeing Vince Pichota get in with uh, Hobo Cassiopo, Chucky Morgan. And, you know, just, he was just barely out of, he was a young, like in his twenties. And, and Vinci Pichotta always wanted to be a mob guy. The word was that in high school, he had a big grand godfather poster in his room. He always wore black. He, he had a black car. He wore black. And, and he was the kind of guy who's working at a liquor store and, uh, during these years. And he had an argument with a customer and he shot and killed him. And then another killing in 1980 was a transit down in the uh, city market area. A lot of, of homeless guys down in the city market area. And, and uh, nobody really knows exactly what it was about other than he shot and killed this guy 
but the uh, the witness disappeared before they could have a trial. So he beat that case. And somehow these guys ended up being these partners in crime. And you talk about whether he was his driver or not. What, what we have seen over the years in Kansas City is like, uh, I have to use Tuffy Luna as a great example. He and, and Charlie Mortina, who was another one of these kind of le- on the same level as Tuffy, but slightly below and slightly different. These two guys would had a younger guy that they were mentoring in Joe Ragusa and Vince Abbott. So they would like, they would call them their comp. And that was kind of their term for it, my compadre or my comp on the phone. And they would always tell them where they were going. The comp would call in if they were going somewhere else, you would see them together all the time. And so, so Mark Sorrentino became, became Vincey Pichotta's comp, this guy that he was probably bringing in. He was also, Sorrentino was a tough guy and, and was willing to do what he needed to do. He, he was uh, repoing cars for the Camasanos. A uh, uh, guy emailed me when this all started coming out about him getting out of jail. And he said, yeah, he said, he, he said, I think he came up under Pete Simone, but I, I only saw him working like doing this car repo business for the Camasanos. And during these years, the Kansas city mob, you know, you're out of the kind of your normal loan sharking business. You're going because they took the uh, interest rate cap off of small loans. They're doing uh, payday loans. They're doing uh, title loans. They're doing the buy here, pay here car business. There's a lot of money in that, especially when you don't really have to follow the rules on collecting. And that was the thing about this, uh, this dude that, uh, that owned that Rodney Anderson that owned the uh, this restaurant corporation. They had more than one restaurant and they owned the Hereford house. And, and he had borrowed every cent he could get. He had gone into his uh, children's uh, trust funds. He had robbed his, his wife's IRA. And according to one article I read, he, he also had gotten some money from payday loan places. So now all of a sudden it hits me. Well, that's how he got connected up. I remember thinking at the time, how did he even know who to go to? How do you know who to go to? Now he's in the restaurant business, but it was it wasn't the kind of restaurant that that professional criminals even would go to for the most part, especially not Italians. They, they're going to go to Casconi's or one of nice Italian Marable's nice Italian place. They're not going to the Hereford House. It was a steakhouse. It's a place Peckerwoods go. A place guys like me go to. But that must be how it was. I think he he got in so deep with the loan sharks. Through the pay, he called it payday loan business that then somebody came to him and said, okay, we can help you out here because there was a huge payoff in the end if this all came out, if it all worked well. You know, a little a side story uh, for the listeners, if you will. Uh, this was in uh, – just around this time that we're, we're on up to the 2000s. When did this is 2000? This is October of 08. 08, yeah. At that point in time, I was just starting to work on that first mob documentary I did called Gangland Wire. And I knew this guy who worked at Chubby's. And, and he had told me that Vince Pichota and Mark Sorrentino were down there almost every night. Well, Chubby's was owned by a, uh, a sports book guy. Uh, named uh, Pete, uh, oh, 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 God, um, uh, Labruzzo, Nick Labruzzo, Nick Labruzzo, who is, uh, that's where John Manicina is living now. He was owned by Nick Labruzzo and Vincey Pichota and Mark Sorrentino were down there about every night, late at night, after all the joints had closed down, there's a 24-hour joint. So I'd ask this guy, I said, hey, I said, go to him and just say, you know, hey, I know this guy. He used to be a policeman. Don't don't hide that fact. He used to be a policeman, and he'd like to interview just somebody that was in the life, just to, you know, get some uh, some uh, uh, kind of inside knowledge about it. You don't have. I mean, he's not asking you to do anything. Just talk to him about it. So this Mark Sorrentino says, "Ah, I said all he's doing is looking for a snitch," and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> about that same time. This FBI is in Kansas City. He was the main mob buster. Bill Owsley releases his second book about his career, Mobsters in Our Midst. And it, it talked about a lot of these more modern things rather than a history of the mob in Kansas City. And, and I know the guy that is a Kansas City store and it had a whole bunch of copies of that book. <laughs> so one day this guy comes in 
great big guy. He was describing him to me. Uh, and he said, this great big guy came in. He was bitching and pissing and moaning about how he had to buy a bunch of copies of this FBI agent's book. And it was all a bunch of lies. And, and, but he bought them anyhow. And he said that about uh, two hours later, the guy came back and bought about 10 more copies. Of it. Somebody was sending him down to buy these copies. And that's what he found out the guy, he got the guy to tell him what his name was. And it was Mark Sorrentino. So see, he was that kind of guy that they'd run and, and do errands. That's, that's what kind of guy he was. And that's, I'd say that's how he ended up with uh, Vince Bishota. Bishota was bringing him in because he was tough. He could collect money. He, you know, he could help a leg breaker and he was, he kept his mouth shut, obviously, didn't he? They, they did that arson and you have to wonder there was a third guy in that arson. Uh, you have to wonder the the arson crew before that was, uh, uh Joe Ragusa and a guy named John Crescio. And, and I got a feeling it was probably one of them that were the, uh, the third man, shall we say, it's like the movie, the third man. Well, they have, they had Pichota and Sorrentino on security right. footage. There was, there was another guy with them kind of was seen in the background or something. And, so, and, you know, and anyhow, and the owner, Rod Anderson had taken Pichota on a tour of the, of the restaurant um, under the pretense that Pichota was uh, trying to purchase it um, back in, couple weeks before that i know that like you were asking like how does a guy like rod anderson even interact with wise guys and you're absolutely right about the um you know the, the payday loans and everything but he got he got to Peshota through sorrentino anderson according to the the, the file that i read anderson oh, met oh, oh, oh. rod anderson who owned hereford house was yeah. introduced to Pichota by Sorrentino. Yeah. But then how did he meet Sorrentino? Especially if Sorrentino. I think, be you, I, think what you, I think what you said, though, I think it was through the payday loans. It's payday loans. He was, see, he was collecting yeah. for payday loan guy. And then, you know, he says, hey, we can help you here. Because in the end, they made, let's see, like I got my notes here. They had like a total loss. They, they were making a claim on the insurance of $2.4 million, $2 million, basically. Right. A uh, total loss on that thing. So there was a payday at the end of this deal for everybody. And they collected, they collected the first check. They collected a 350000 yeah, $350, yeah. $350, They collected uh, within a couple months or a couple yeah, weeks. The, the arrest didn't happen until, or the indictment didn't go down until 09. But the, the actual right. arson took place in October of 08. Right, because they had to wait till uh, Mark Sorrentino and his wife Jennifer split up. I think because they had they right. played that tape all over the place, trying to find out who it was. And I think they probably maybe had some people saying this is probably who this looks like, and but not but anybody that are going to go to trial. But then the Mark Sorrentino and his wife split up, and uh, she just hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I guess they. They had been out at the Argosy Casino, one of the local casinos, celebrate her birthday that night. They come home, and then Mark goes back out with his friend, Vince Pichota. Several hours later, she's wakened by screams, and she came down into the kitchen. She found Mark all beet red and smelling of gasoline, really strongly of gasoline. <laughs> and, uh, so that was that was just, you know, what that was probably the final nail in the coffin of any other evidence that they had of course they tried to discredit her uh in any way they could but you know it didn't work it didn't work both vincey and mark Sorrentino and rod anderson are all convicted and sorrentino and vincey are sentenced to 20 year prison sentences one fifteen and one twenty. Yeah, uh, Mark was fifteen and and Vince was twenty because he had those prior uh, convictions or that prior murder conviction. They said. So, now it's two thousand twenty four. Well, let's, let's let me back up for a second. Two thousand twenty one. Eddie Cox comes out of prison, gets himself out. Um, <laughs> you know the you, you can't. Uh, 
don't don't you know don't write the the, the end chapter until uh, it, it, the door actually slams because he there were a lot of people had written him off and thought he was never going to yeah. get out and he got out. He's eighty nine years old. Well, he got out when he was eighty six, I guess, and uh, starts helping people matriculate out of prison. Um, now, Marky Sorrentino doesn't have any. I don't believe, at least federally, he doesn't have any. Well, I guess you would consider arson violence, but it uh, he has, doesn't have any assault or murder or um, counts. But the first guy that Eddie Cox helps get out is Johnny Mandacina. And that was a year or two ago, who was a Kansas City Mafia soldier in on a homicide. And Eddie Cox helps John Mandacina get out before he helps Mark Sorrentino get out. Yeah. Can you tell exactly. people what you what you remember about Johnny Mandacina? No, well, you know, he had this uh, club, or not a club, really a neighborhood tavern restaurant, kind of your usual thing down by the city market called Red Front. It was immensely popular. I ate a lot of Italian steaks myself down there, meatball sandwiches, at a bar with it. And it was got it was a hangout for guys. And there's uh, some professional criminals that would hang out in there. You know, he knew though, he was one of these guys that knew those people. He was a loan shark himself, I believe. And he, I don't think he was in the sports book, but he, he might have been, but more of a loan shark. I once got an informant because a guy was living in an apartment building that John owned, just an old raggedy apartment building over in the north side or over the east side. And he couldn't pay his rent. And he was kind of an obnoxious little guy. Anyhow, man, to see him beat him within the inch of his life, put him in the hospital. I found out about it. I went to see the guy. You know, he started talking to me after that. But yeah, I tell you, he he never was worth. He never did tell me anything. But that's what kind of guy Mandacino was. He's a bad dude. But he, there's a guy named Larry Strada who has is a bookie. He has another joint, uh, really near the red front called the. Uh, uh, God, the Cadillac, not Cadillac Corner. Uh, I wrote God, a story about it. I can't think of. I, I can't think of the name either. Anyhow, it's it's just another one of these taverns. They sell pizza and sandwiches, and, and it's kind of a sports bar. And, you know, it's not just a mob hangout. A lot of Pecker Woods go there, and all kinds of people go there. Young guys, and and he's he's running a book, and and they they're taking. They've been on an investigation. The FBI has been on investigation, wiretaps, and everything. They're starting to take it down, and. Uh, and Larry Strada is going to be one of the defendants in this because he's they've got him on the wire booking bets. And I think they maybe served a search warrant on him, got some evidence. And, and I guess they either think he was going to talk or he was going no, to. He, was, he, he talked. He talked. He talked. He, talk, he did talk. And it came out somehow that he was talking. Now, he had talked about Pete Simone sometime in the past, I guess. So he was not exactly a well-liked guy. And he lives in a little suburban neighborhood north of the river. He comes out of his house, I believe, to take the trash out to the corner or something. And somebody shoots him in his driveway, which is kind of unusual. You kill somebody in their own driveway. But kill, he kind of shows a lack of respect. But they kill him in his own driveway. So, you know, it's another unsolved mob murder at that time. Well, months later, a year later, this Patrick McGuire, who is a professional criminal, really bad guy, you know, traveling bank robber and the whole nine yards and, and a real bad, real bad guy in the criminal subculture, in the prison subculture. He's a bad dude. And he's telling a, supposedly he tells a cellmate about that he killed Larry Strada and John Manicina paid him to do it. Well, the cellmate then needs to make wants to get out and he makes a deal and testifies that they end up convicting John Mancina mm -hmm. uh, of the Larry Strip paying Patrick McGuire and, and convict Patrick McGuire of it too. And who been a lot who, of controversy ever since about that conviction and, and people on the street, they keep saying, I've got several guys that are in the know that, that say, you know, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. They just set that guy up and he took the fall for it. Who was the unindicted co-conspirator in that case? Oh boy, I don't remember. I don't know. Do you know? It was Pete. It was Pete Simone. Oh, Pete. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I. I guess I maybe I did know that. Yeah, he was. So a lot. So guy. just for for people that might not know, we've, that means the guy that talked. <laughs> we we we've uh, mentioned Pete Simone's name a couple times on here uh, for people that might be new to us. Uh, Pete Simone, aka Las Vegas Pete, uh, is 
allegedly the underboss of what's left of the Sevilla crime family this, uh, you know, in the 2020s. And uh, he got his nickname because he used to run uh, travel junkets to Las Vegas, the Kansas City. Again, the movie Casino, we know that Kansas City had a, a big chunk of the of the hotel casino uh, market back in the day when the mob road ran Las Vegas. And uh, Mandacina was with some, according to the uh, indictment, Mandacina was with Simone at the social club, the trap, uh, in the hours before and hours after Strata was Strata, Strata was killed. Yeah, so, I, I uh, kind of remember that. And geographically, that's all within about 10 blocks. Everything's in the yeah. same little neighborhood, that little Italy down there. So uh, anyway, Mandacina got out last, I think it was 2023. Eddie Cox helps him get out. He had cancer. He seems to be still, I think he's still alive. They tell me he's doing good. <laughs> tell uh, me he went on a trip uh, out, of, out of the country, went to Mexico last winter. <laughs> so the so, guy that, uh, that told me. <laughs> and then, now, another thing about Mark Sorrentino, a guy emailed me after it came out that he got out. It was in the papers and, and wanted to make sure I knew about it. And he said, you know, he's and this is a guy that's in the know. And he's never told me who he was, uh, who he is. He has, you know, a funny uh, email address. And he's always telling me little things. And he said, you know, he said that, that Mark Sorrentino, he said he would have been a made guy in the old days. He said he was one tough dude. And and he, you know, that's where I learned about him repoing cars for uh, the Camasano. So he was he was that well respected. This guy tells me that it, in the old days, they would have made him uh, uh, as a soldier. So Mark gets out last week. I don't want to get into um people's uh, personal health uh, unless it's public i know with mandacina um there was the cancer diagnosis i think was in the court record mm -hmm. i'm not sure about mark i know there are some health issues but i don't want to give people's uh you know medical charts whatnot yeah but uh mark got out a week ago i think he got out yeah we're recording so. this on a monday I think he got out a week ago yesterday. So I think it was uh, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday uh, before that. He's 58 years old, so he's not old per se. Um, I guess as we as we wrap it up here, you could, however you feel comfortable talking in generalities or whatnot. I have I have no issue reporting that, uh, that Johnny Joe Sorrentino and. Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas, Pete Simone run what's left of the Kansas City mob in 2024. They're old school guys that go all the way back yeah. to the 60s and 70s. People question, you know, just the Kansas City mob. You know, they, they want they people want to, in my opinion, want to write the obit a little soon. And that's not to yeah. say that the Kansas City mafia is some giant superpower. <laughs> But they exist, and you have guys like this that th – these are no spring chickens, and these guys are OGs. I mean, they go back to the era where the mafia was omnipresent and did have that kind of power. And they just, they're just they not just going to go into retirement and go live in Shady Acres. So that's my yeah. opinion. Gary, what's your yeah. take on the, the mafia in Kansas City in 2024? You know, and, and what I see, see, there's nobody paying any attention to them anymore. I pay more attention to them than any law enforcement people do. And, and I try not to, cause I don't, right. <laughs> you know, I got to live here. Uh, uh, but I know I, and I've seen it myself that he hangs out at this one bar, the one bar you reported where he got in a, a fight with his son. He hangs out there. And I, I have a lot of people report that they see him there. If I hear they're going there. Uh, They'll say it's part of a restaurant and they'll come back and I'll get hold of them to say, Oh yeah, he was there. He's there all the time. He meets with, you see him talking with people, quiet conversations outside. So, you know, there's, uh, if it looks like a duck and it talks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, why I would say there's still something going on with that guy for sure. Now, Johnny Joe Shorentino, I'd see him or I've seen him drive around. I, I hear that they meet, you know, but maybe no more than a bunch of old coppers. Some of these guys meet Frank DeLuna. He's around. 
lives in his mom's house. Uh, you know that they, they Vince Abbott, think, Vince Abbott's but, still alive. He's still alive. Yeah, he's still alive. And and they meet and they talk and you know a bunch of old coppers sit around telling war stories. Maybe I don't know, and I doubt there's a lot of of action going on. It's probably these younger guys. And this uh, you know uh, this uh, buy here pay here car business and payday loans and and things like that and you know it's city street street like, gambling i mean street people people have a misconception that that you see all these commercials on television about yeah. legalized gambling and and draft kings and you know uh um the, you go into a, a a a stadium now you can be placing bets legally yeah. on your phone and they think yeah. that that just eliminated the black market gambling and it it, it hasn't yeah. In any ways, it's helped them. I think so. There's you still you that. Gotta have your, you got to have your money up front with the yeah. with the apps with the with the right. bookie. You know, hey, you can run a tab for a while and maybe you know get in and then have a big hit one weekend and have about five teams hit on you and then you can get cleaned back up again. So you can't do that with the apps and and I think that's one of the main attractions of the bookie is the, they extend your credit. You don't have to have the money when you make the bet. And you don't have to, and if you lose, you you don't have to pay maybe for a little bit. There's a way to then come back without have to actually have the cash. A lot of these guys, these degenerate gamblers, they've lost all their credit cards anyhow. They don't have any uh, credit. They don't have anything, but they still are going to gamble. So that's, uh, you're always going to have that. Plus the, kind of the convenience of going in your, you know, your local bookie, kind of the charm of that, going in the bar and, and meeting your local bookie and saying, hey, you know, I want this, this, and this. And, and that kind of thing. You just can't do the fun little bets on what's going to happen in the next the prop, 20, prop, the prop the prop bets. Prop bets. So they're always going to have that up on the bookie. But the bookie's people, always going to be there. And, and for older people, when I say older, yeah. let's, say, let's say 50 and older, they want to have they want to feel the money. They want the money in their hands. <laughs> they don't want to just see like, it a number on a screen of your I iPhone. Know. Right. It's like going to the casino anymore. You know, it's just ding, 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 or, you know, play cards, I guess you can do that, but everything's, you know, back in the, in the cloud. Two more things I want to hit on before we finish. First is I don't want to talk specifics in terms of a name, but both Gary and I last year heard that a meeting took place in Kansas city um, between a prominent East Coast Mafia figure uh, and some of the leaders of what's left of KC. Um, I, I have not been able to confirm that. I don't think Gary's been able to confirm yeah. that as, as definitive, but it, it, maybe I'm going to take these two things and make it into one. Um, I've also heard from firsthand sources that Vince Pichota in Fort Dix right now in New Jersey, and he's been in Fort Dix for a little while now, has done quite a bit of politicking um, mm -hmm. with other crime families. And I'm not, con I'm not, I don't want to connect what we heard about a meeting and Pichota being in prison do I think it's possible there could be a connection there? Yes. Again, I don't want to to speculate that, that that's the case. I think it's possible, though. Um, do you feel like in an era where there's a lot of um, farm outs, I guess, or or proxies and and where where you don't necessarily I know I'm all over the place here. I, I, it's it seems like Kansas City, if they want to continue and 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 evolve instead of die, even if they evolve in the small, smaller size organization that they are, it seems like you kind of have to start doing more business with people outside of your. Yeah. stomping grounds if you want to sustain and, and continue. I think that might have been a case way back in the day, and then it kind of stopped, and now it seems like it might be a, a case 
again, does that, I don't know if I articulated that correctly. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I know I had a guy get hold of me and, and he said, I saw a guy who's a pretty well known mobster at a Italian restaurant. And he said, I swear it was him. Now I could never confirm or verify it, but, uh, he, he, he's a guy that uh, that uh, people might see once in a while. <laughs> well, and it's a guy. I'll say also again, without naming who the guy is that we heard, it's a guy that since you know, I'd say in the last decade himself has been politicking, yeah. Um, yeah. and and uh, meeting with other people from other families. So again, there's that's no just because A is true and B is true doesn't necessarily mean. That, um, that equals C, but just again for 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 uh, for context sake. Yeah, you just got. I, I don't know what kind of you know with the internet, everything's gotten smaller. The world's gotten so much smaller, and and communication is so much easier. And then some of these scams are going to be on the internet that they might invest in, and then of course the uh, buy here pay here car dealers and and that thing has been that's really almost. I think take it up, take it over as much as sports gambling was at, at one time. It's just, it, it's a big deal. It's a lot of money, a lot more money than anybody ever realizes in, in that buy here, pay here car dealerships and the uh, payday loan and the uh, uh, title loan thing. So it's uh, well, I hear, that's, I, that's going to be a local deal. I've heard, and I want to uh, get your take on this too. Um, I've heard that even though the guys that we're talking about are not involved in drugs, that there are drug operations currently in Kansas city that facilitate some level of tribute to somebody, not necessarily a made guy, but that that money in theory could find its way to made guys. That there's yeah, some I, I connection. I, 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 okay, well, again, I, I, I definitely, yeah, I definitely but, you know, you. it's those are one of those things that you know it's, it's possible. It's highly possible okay. because those guys, again, they they've been in the penitentiary with each other. And they come back out and they know each other, and it's like uh, you know, there's no. You were talking about the black and white thing with the Italians. Well, it's just if that level of criminal activity, you know, they know each other. They've been in the prison with each other and they know each other. And if you like junior Bradley, he was working with Terry Kelton, one of the biggest black, one of the big black heroin dealer and, and cocaine after uh, the black mafia days. And he kept it up out of the penitentiary and junior Bradley was working with him. And he was, you know, his, this Kelton's wife, he had Kelton had sent a message through Bradley to get his wife killed because she was going to testify. And, and she did testify and she testified that she saw junior Bradley give one of Kelton's guys, like a whole uh, grocery sack full of cash money to, you know, put into the drug business. So there, you know, it's going on. There's no doubt about it. I just, you know, I don't know exactly who, but it's going on because they know each other and they know who you can trust and who you can't trust on oh. that level but that level nobody ever sees that you're just really lucky to ever get anything out of that final question Vince pashota has got five years left supposed to come out in 29 he'll be 74 I believe or 75 mm -hmm. um if there is a future boss or another boss of the Kansas City Mafia uh is it possible that that's uh, Vincey Black? That's again something that I've heard. Oh yeah, that, oh yeah. If there's any way, if there's any way, I mean, this guy is. I mean, he just like Mark Sorrentino. They're born and bred mafia. They want to be in the mafia. I mean, that's that's what they want. And there's a certain person out there that wants to be in the mafia. They wants to be connected. They like to say they're connected. They like that. You know, getting a swag and and the jewelry and knowing the guy that's, that's got all the stolen jewelry. So you can then have, you know, get cheap jewelry and sell to somebody else. You know, it's uh, and, and he is one of those guys. It's just, it's been his life ever since he was a teenager. It's been his life. So if there's any way, you know, why he's going to do it any way he can, uh, can do something like that.
And I would say there probably is. Gary, you, you've done it all. You've seen it all. You're, you, you are a wealth of knowledge and I'm so happy you came back on. We're going to, I'd love to, uh, you, you're just, you're, again, we talk about hidden gems in Kansas city on the street. Well, he, this guy is a hidden gem, uh, in terms of, uh, people, uh, that, that do, do the good work and, and tell everybody where they can find you. Gary puts out great content. Go, uh, Get yourself some Gary Jenkins if you, if you want real great analysis, history, and, and stories about the mafia. All right. Well, I have Gangland Wire podcast on all the apps. Uh, I've got my documentary films that tell you as much as you ever wanted to know about the Kansas City mob during the 70s, during the Savella Spiro War. That's called Brothers Against Brothers. They're on uh, and Gangland Wire, which is about the skimming and how we got into the skimming from Las Vegas and, and kind of what happened during that investigation. And those are both on uh, Amazon as $1.99 rentals. Uh, I have a, a, a recent, oh, I did a book called uh, Leaving Vegas, the true story of how FBI wiretaps ended mob domination of Las Vegas casinos. Yep. That I use a lot of the transcripts from the wiretaps. I, and, and if you get the Kindle version, you can click on a link and hear the actual video audio because I got all that out of the court file after oh, when so I started cool. making that gangland wire movie. And then I recently did one called Windy City Mafia, kind of straight outside of Kansas City just for fun. And it's a series of it's seven or eight chapters and each one's a different story. And it's from some story I covered on my podcast. I just wanted to do some of the interesting little side stories about the outfit and I'll do New York next from my podcast. So uh, I've got that out there too. It's great stuff. And I just, it just want, it makes me want to leave us with an anecdote from uh, <laughs> one of Gary's signature cases uh, talking about the skimming and, and straw man and that he, you know, he helped, uh, uh, bring that all uh, to fruition, it, the stuff you see in the movie Casino. And there's a scene where they're talking, where, where the De Niro character is voicing over and they're talking about the bug that's in the Kansas City. In the movie, it's a Kansas City, uh, like, deli or uh, you know, sandwich shop. Yeah. But in reality, it was in this place called the Villa Capri. And right. that's some of the stuff, I, I'm guessing that that, that uh, wire is in part of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've got just, the, there's not much. I, I, there's not much out of that because what happened was they heard him talking on that wire because they're trying to listen for some murder plans about this right. Savala Spiro gang war that was and going they stumbled on. And, upon. And, and they start talking about Las Vegas and twenty five million dollars and Teamsters. Are we in on that with them? And, I, and then Tuffy says, I got to find a phone. And, and so, you know, then it spun off to because we found the phone when Tuffy was going to it. We found Tuffy at the phone about it took about a week and we got on that phone and they just you know, they left the bill of Capri. So there's only a couple of about the bill of Capri. But you can hear that one right there that that started that whole thing. Oh, and this and it's one of my favorite lines in the movie Casino when De Niro's talking about it, he's like this guy and he's basically talking about. <laughs> Tuffy, but in the movie it's Artie Pascal. Yeah. This guy yeah. basically sunk the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> Just inadvertently talking about something that the feds weren't even looking into. And all of yeah. a sudden, well, I just yeah. wanted to tell everyone. Yeah, another, another another good one about that little scene was he's talking about going to be reimbursed for his expenses going right. to Las Vegas. He said he writes it down. The guy said, what are you going to pay income tax? And you know, that was the, that was the final nail in the coffin is when we were in Tuffy's house, we found the records that he wrote down and then they could match them up with the wiretaps and with informants or with witnesses talking. And I mean, that just sunk the whole are thing. You telling, I always, this, this is again, neither here nor there, but I love the line where, are you telling me, the guys that we're paying to steal are stealing from us. Hey, we're like, us. It's, yeah. called, it's called leakage. He said it's called yeah, leakage. Yeah. Leakage got my that balls. I want my money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the great way to end. Right, Gary, th thank you so right. much. Uh, this has been great. Please like, share, and subscribe. OG Pod. Go check out Gangland Wire with Gary Jenkins. We're going to have him back at some point in the coming months. Uh Thank you so much, Benny Behind the Glass, Scott Bernstein, OG Pod.